Welcome to the Mises Academy podcast. I'm Danny Sanchez, Director of Online Learning at the Mises Institute. For this episode, I interviewed Peter Klein, Executive Director and Carl Menger Research Fellow at the Mises Institute, about his LouRockwell.com article, Universities to MOOCs, We Will Assimilate You. Universities used to have, um, in the medieval era, um, a certain independence from the state that they that they were granted charters that gave them certain rights, and they um, were protected by the church, which which used, which during the Middle Ages was um, was separate from was rivalrous with the state. Um, but later, the universities were assimilated, and you had things like ministries of worship and instruction, and and the intellectual bodyguard of the Hohenzollern, like we talked about before. Um, in your uh, article, you talk about the state the that you the state through its university appendages may try to assimilate um, the MOOCs the and and other alternative uh, education o- offers. Um, do you do you see that happening? Uh, do you see them being successful in that? And if if they can't assimilate, if they can't join them, will they will they kill them? Will, if they can't assimilate them, will they crack down on them? Yeah, that's a interesting sort of case study uh, of of the kind of general principles that we're that we're talking about. So uh, the ability to deliver courses at a distance. Of course, we've had that for for decades, so-called correspondence courses. But then, with the rise of the internet and streaming audio and video and so forth, it's, it seems pretty obvious that you can have uh, a, a learned individual and expert communicating knowledge or facilitating a conversation among a large group of small or large group of students without all being physically present in the same room. You can do it through video conferencing and audio conferencing and you can send them the articles as, uh, you know, electronic documents. They can read e- ebooks and so forth. So uh, when these technologies first became available, they were adopted by the new entrants, the for-profit uh, vocational schools were much quicker to adopt these kinds of distance learning technologies, online learning technologies, than the privileged incumbents. But the incumbents saw the writing on the wall and they said, yeah, well, we need to offer distance learning courses too. What people call a MOOC, right? A MOOC is just a distance learning course with lots and lots of students and typically open enrollment. So one doesn't have to be a, a, a you know, you don't have to don't have to be admitted to MIT to take a, a MOOC from, that's offered by MIT. You just go to a website and maybe you sign up or you just click and watch the video or whatever. MOOC standing for Massively Open Online Courses. Right. So it's an online course that is open to anybody who wants to take it and typically, you know, with, on a very large scale, hence the M for, for massive. Mm. So uh, there are a lot of private companies uh, that provide MOOCs, sometimes on their own, sometimes in partnership with universities who supply the professors and the curricula and so forth. Um, One of the things that I think has been fascinating is that the established universities uh, originally sort of slow to embrace the MOOC are now starting to bring it on are now starting to jump right into the fray and say, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, we're all about MOOCs. We think MOOCs are great. You shouldn't take it from a private company. You should take it from us. And then you get our you know, high quality. Essentially, this is a way of kind of co-opting the technology of assimilating the technology, as in your, uh, as as you said when you when you asked the question. But as I mentioned before, if you look at the history of technological innovation, it's been very very difficult for incumbents to be successful in incorporating the new technology into their traditional business. The classic reference on this is a very influential business book by Clayton Christensen called The Innovator's Dilemma. Christensen introduced a concept that he called or popularized what he called disruptive innovation. And he pointed out that uh, incumbents for a variety of reasons, because there's a lot of inertia, they already have a lot of established routines and procedures that have evolved to fit the old technology. They have an existing revenue stream from using the old model, which might be threatened by the introduction of the new model. It's generally easier to start with a blank sheet of paper and create kind of a new business model that uses the new technology. It's very, very hard for successful incumbents to switch from the old technology to the new or to you know use embrace the new in parallel with the old. And as I said, we 
before we see this in you know, transportation and manufacturing and most of the high tech sector. And everybody knows that if you look at digital music, right, when digital, the technology for MP3s and so forth came about, it wasn't the record companies that figured out a way to make money from selling digital music. They tried and, 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 and failed completely. It was Apple who, not a new company, but Apple was a new entrant into the digital music and media space. It was an outsider that figured out a way to successfully incorporate this new delivery method and storage method uh, for, for playing songs. And of course, now the record, the established record companies, they want to use that same technology. They want to put their song, distribute their songs through iTunes and so forth. But again, uh, the universities today are in the same position as the record industry, and it's just it doesn't seem likely that they they would be very good at incorporating the latest and greatest distance learning technology. Now, the article that you mentioned that I that I wrote uh, was was playing off an article in Slate that referred to specifically to what they call the flipped classroom model. So, what they mean is the traditional model is the professor gives a lecture. Um, the students listen to the lecture, then they go home and they're in the lecture hall listening to the lecture. Then they go home and they do homework problems and write essays and those kind of you know small group activities on their own. Then they come back the next day, the professor gives another lecture in the classroom and so forth. The flipped model says, well, why not do those things in reverse? So if the professor can record the lecture onto a video, then the students can watch the video at home and then when they come to the classroom, the professor can work with them on homework problems and different sorts of exercises and so forth. So it's, it's you know, flipping what you do in class versus what you do at home. Now, this, this is hardly a new model. Uh, this is very well known, uh, uh, you know, idea of making the best use of face-to-face -face time. And most studies show that we 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 best retain information not when we hear it in a lecture, but when we get it out of some kind of problem solving technique or a Socratic dialogue, you know, discussion using the so-called Socratic method. So good college teachers have always known that you shouldn't spend all your time during class hours lecturing. That's not an effective way to teach. You should engage in Socratic dialogue or have interactive, you know, group activities and problem solving and so forth. The idea with the MOOCs is, oh, well, now it's easy to do that because all the lectures will be online and we'll just, you know, solve homework problems in class. The problem is uh, teaching by giving a lecture, contrary to what people often think, is much, much easier than teaching through, you know, carefully structured interactive activities. Most faculty members in regular universities are not trained how to do anything other than give lectures. Uh, they're not very good at organized problem solving sessions. And if they're, you know, research scholars with PhDs, they're probably vastly overqualified for doing the kinds of things that, according to this flipped model, they should be doing. The idea is, well, the students watch the lectures and then, you know, famous Professor Smith helps them with their homework when they're in class. Okay, I mean, fine. If you want to use that model, that's great. But why on earth would they want to pay $100,000 for some homework tutoring sessions with Professor Smith? They can more easily get the homework tutoring online or from a much more effective and lower cost provider. Yeah, it seems that it's such a waste when you have um, <clears throat> not only intellectuals of that caliber spending a lot of time um, um, doing so a lot of times they're they're really great at lecturing but they're not necessarily great at helping uh, students through problem sets and, and whatnot and so that seems like a misallocation but there's also a, a broader misallocation in in terms of unappreciated teachers um, all, going all the way back to uh, Johann Sebastian Bach when he was a instructor at the St. Thomas Church in, in Leipzig uh, I was reading his biography and talking about how the students there had no idea what kind of a genius that they had trying trying to teach them and and, and pulling his hair out trying to get them to to do their exercises. The same thing with with Murray Rothbard at at Poly, uh, Brooklyn Polytechnic and UNLV. Um, the students there had no idea 
uh, what they had. Um, so with these online courses, it seems that that you have more of an opportunity for uh, students who would really appreciate working with them to, to find them and for them to, to come together. That's right. I think we need to bring it back to this idea of the cartel that you mentioned before. Most of what established universities and university faculty are doing now about how to use MOOCs or how to restructure the classroom or whatever, ultimately it all comes down to protecting their current position, right? Universities don't want their funding cut and professors don't want to lose their jobs or have their salaries cut. That's ultimately what they're aiming at is how do we handle this new technology in a way that maintains our privileged position in society, et cetera. See, see, that's why this is such a threat. Again, if you go back to this idea of the MOOC or um, uh, 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 just, you know, video lectures more generally, I mean, let's say the subject is American history, you know, uh, 20th century American history. Under the current model, right, every college and every university has at least one, two, three, four professors with PhDs in American history who are teaching that intro to 20th century American history course and, you know, not necessarily living an extravagant lifestyle, but making a pretty good living doing that job. Now we have the ability for students at every college and university, for students in every city and town to, to, to get that lecture, not from the professor on their campus, but from some professor somewhere out in cyberspace who happens to be the world's best lecturer who can give a brilliant talk on some aspect of 20th century uh, uh, U U.S. history. And he who knows where this person is located? And this person may or may not also be a, a famous researcher. This person may just be a, a great lecturer. What the professor in your hometown college doesn't want is his students getting that lecture from somebody else. And notice how it scales up. I mean, if this person is really great and they're lecturing into a camera, 10 students, 100, 1,000, a million students can all watch the lecture and get a much better lecture than they would get from the local professor. Now, of course, there are some differences. There are some cases where you need somebody on site for more interactive things. But there are many cases where one professor who's really good at it uh, uh, can give that lecture in a way that's much more effective than having every uh, professor do it. But you see, of course, that's a huge threat. Right. If I'm a professor of American history, I don't want to lose my job to the MOOC just as, you know, I, I don't want to lose my factory job to a robot or whatever. I want to keep the robots out and I want to keep the MOOCs out or I want to incorporate the MOOCs as a supplement somehow. I just don't want them to be a substitute for me and for my job. That's why this model is so, so threatening to sort of the traditional structure. So what the universities have done is to say, oh yeah, we're all about MOOCs, we're all about distance learning, but for example, if you're, say, you know, the University of Wisconsin, just to pick a random example, they'll say things like, yes, now all the professors at Wisconsin can give lectures into a webcam so that the, you know, the teeming masses in Southeast Asia or in Sub-Saharan Africa can now consume our professors' courses. Wow, isn't that great? Of course, you see that means no unemployment for University of Wisconsin professors. Yeah. What they don't want is all their students taking the lecture from some guy in India who happens to be better at giving the lecture than their own faculty. The universities see the MOOC as something that they, they're only interested in it if it can enhance their status position. They're not interested in it. They will fight it. They will resist it if it means a threat to their business model. Yeah, not not everybody can teach math like Salman Khan, uh, the the founder of of Khan Academy, um, and so his uh, Khan Academy website has been used. It was one of the most prominent early. Uh, uses of flipping uh, because a lot of math teachers would use uh, they would have them the students watch the Khan Academy videos at home and then um, and then do problem sets in the classroom and and so you have Khan as sort of sort of like a rock star instructor that he's he's a, a celebrity instructor and and um, it's based on merit and there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about. Kim Ki Hoon uh, uh, South, uh, in South Korea, who earns four million dollars a year as a rock star teacher, um, that he's been teaching over twenty years in the country's private after-school tutoring academies, and um, and so it seems that this is more getting towards um, what Adam Smith 
talked about he talked about higher education and um uh, the higher education in Oxford was especially bad because he he said that um that teacher compensation uh, wasn't tied at all to performance, uh, whereas in Scotland, um, the, a lot of the fees were were paid. Uh, were a, a lot of the renew, uh, payment was from student fees and student honoraria. Um, so, do you see that as a really promising development? Well, it could be. Uh, it, it depends on how the uh, the structure of the higher education system how it's changed, how these kinds of things we're discussing are, are, are played out. Uh, most universities, um, or in most universities, there's a lot of discussion about compensation and sort of merit-based pay, all revolving around problems of measurement. How do you measure research quality? Should it be based on the number of publications or the prestige of the publications or the number of citations? How do you measure teaching quality? Is it Should it be based on student evaluations or something else? But you see, all of those those controversies, those discussions that you can read about in the Chronicle of Higher, Higher Education, the trade paper for the university sector, they all take place assuming that the existing structure of the university remains in place, right? If, if professors were freelancers, right, as in, you know, ancient Greece or something, the where sophists. they would, right, they would sell their research output on a piece by piece basis, or they would sell their lectures then you wouldn't have to have a university committee that evaluates quality. You would let the market evaluate quality, just as you're describing. And if somebody can attract thousands or millions of students to their MOOC, they would be compensated because the students are paying the professor, right, without without the middleman or with the middleman taking a smaller cut. Or in the case of Salman Khan, where uh, it's free, but he gets so many donations from people like Bill Gates yeah, exactly. because of the um, big impact exactly. that he's having. There are a number of different ways that that sort of, you know, that, that performance, sorry, that compensation can be tied to performance. But it's much more difficult to do if you assume that everybody is an employee of a big university and there's a university compensation committee that decides how people should be paid. Rather, uh, if we have a system like the ones we're talking about that's more open, where there's more competition, there's decentralization, there's fundamental restructuring, we might have something very, very different. But just as you know, some artists don't like the fact that you know, Thomas Kincaid can be a bazillionaire or people like Norman Rockwell and they don't like, you know, high quality art, quote unquote. So the 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 the, so the, the producers of self-described high quality art will poo poo the market system. Say, no, no, of course, that's why you need the, you know, the National Endowment for the Arts should be doling out the money, not the market, because the market will choose the wrong stuff. It's the same argument that proponents of the market have heard a, a million times. You hear the exact same thing in higher ed. Well, yeah, the, I mean, the rock star professor, he's just a showman. We can't trust the students to know what kind of higher education they want. It has to be dictated to them by the elites. Well, I mean, the same arguments that we would use to, to rebut that line of reasoning for art or for automobiles or for anything else would apply with equal force to higher education. Thank you for listening to the Mises Academy podcast. To enroll in online courses, to access other episodes of this podcast, or for more information, visit academy.mises.org.